So now in the second part, I, I will show you some of our own work on this area, which more or less comes back to the things I discussed before, but maybe give them more concrete examples, hopefully helps to make it clear or, or the value of the approaches. And so as, as I said in, in, at the beginning, in our group, we are interested in the question of personalized medicine, and this is nicely summarized by this figure, this is from a postdoc, former postdoc of the lab, Francesco Giorgio. So personalized medicine is solving the puzzle of giving the, finding the right drug for a patient based on molecular data. And our take, in, in also in the spirit of, of this workshop, is how we use biological knowledge and networks to, to solve this. So as I said also earlier, uh, we work on different applications. I will focus today on cancer. And the idea is need to use this different omics data to answer this question. And um, I mentioned also that uh, we use a lot, a large collection of cell lines. So this, these cell lines uh, are 1,000 cell lines from the Sanger Institute, from Matthew Garnett. And we use them because it's a very good model. And because there are cell lines, you can do many things with them. For example, for all of these cell lines, there is exon sequencing, RNA-seq, to some, to some of them now proteomic, epigenetic data, methylation. So you have a lot of molecular data. And then you have the response to drugs. At the moment, it's around 400 drugs, but this number keeps growing. There is also drug combinations done with them. There is also essentiality CRISPR screenings. And so as I saluted before, over, over the years, we really try a lot of different uh, methods on this data apply machine learning, so just input your data, can you predict the drug response? And, and as I said, actually the, the predictability in general is low and, and, and interpreta interpretability is very, very limited. And that was why we try to use these other approaches that use biological knowledge. So I said before that we decided to look at the footprints of the pathways with this tool called Progeny. And this comes back to your question. Your question, yeah. Your question. So how different is to look, for example, at progeny genes that to look at Keck? So this, as, as I explained before, in the classic pathway methods, like if you look at the Keck pathways, you will look at the genes in the pathway. But with progeny, you look at the, at the footprint, at the effect of the pathway on genes. And this figure here shows uh, the differences. So. These genes here are the genes that are downstream of NF kappa B, so down here. And this kind of projection shows you on which keg pathways these genes fall. So the genes that change when you stimulate NF kappa B are to some degree genes in the NF kappa B pathway, this one here, but some of them are on the mappiness pathway, and some of them are on the Jackstead pathway. And the same holds for the other pathways. And, uh, and as I said, this is due to different feedback effects. So now the question is, OK, is it, what is better? If I want to uh, use this for, ana for, for different type of analysis, is it better to look at the footprints or at the genes in the pathways? So then what we did is to go to patient data, the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. We ran our method progeny and different pathway-based methods. Uh, some are pure gene sets, some use to some degree the network topology. And here is a summary of in which cases we found biomarkers of survival of patients. And as you see, we found more with these footprints than with the pathway methods. So this is not like a direct benchmark or validation that the method is finding um, what is supposed to. We, we did that as well with experiments where you put, you activate pathways and you look at the gene expression. But this is kind of what you would do after. So if I use it for downstream analysis, we would have found more uh, things. Like in this case, can I better discriminate these are low gag glioma, so one type of tumor, can, um, brain tumor. And if we separate the patients based on, on one of the progeny pathways, you can better separate in terms of survival. Or you can go back to the cell line data I just showed you in the previous slide. And again, using the different methods, progeny is the one in blue, finding, do we find uh, relationships or associations with drug efficacy? And uh, this is the number of associations we found. 
also as a function of the, of the statistical significance, the FDR. And as you see, the footprints find more and stronger, so more significant association with drug response than, um, than looking at the genes in the pathway. Yeah. This is another very good question. Benchmark, how to benchmark and there is this trade-off between uh, true and false, positive and negatives. Um, so I, I don't have a slice for that. Uh, I can show you later, but what uh, in, we did in this case, at least that the comparison is fair, is to use the exact same pathways. So we use the 15 pathways that we use for one method for the other. Uh, and, uh, and, and we simply found how many associations we find that are true. Um, but in general, indeed, you need to do this balance, and for, especially for the transcription factors, we did a lot of work like this that I can show you later, because I, I agree this is very important. Um, so this is the pathways progeny, and I mentioned before, we do something similar to estimate transcription factor activities. And there we did a lot of benchmarks that, uh, well, it's in the papers, but I can show you later if, if you're interested, but just to show you an example of, again, how this can help. So, like the same thing like with the pathways, if you estimate transcription factor activities, and now you try to see if there is an association between the activity and, in this case, the drug efficacy. Uh, uh, so what we found is that in, another, in a lot of cases where, where there is no genomic marker, you can find uh, a transcription factor association with drug response, or if there is a genomic marker, some mutation, for example, that already tells you it is more likely or less likely than a drug works in a, given, in, in a cancer based on the mutation, the transcription factor allows you to further refine this information. And, and this is such a case. So these are, nutrient 3 alpha is a drug that binds to P53. So if P53 is mutant, the IC50 is higher. This means the drug is less effective because the P53 is mutant, so the drug doesn't have, uh, cannot make its, its effect. But now if, I, if you look at the wild type that they don't have the mutation and you separate based on these transcription factor activities, whether P53, which is a transcription factor, is active or not, you can better refine the efficacy of the drug. So this is an example how these features allow you to find new biomarkers, or if you have a genetic biomarker, to further stratify patients from it. And uh, another uh, example uh, I want to show is from these inferred paths, from this carnival. So as I said before, in carnival what you try to do is to connect stimulations from pathways to transcription factors by finding uh, which causal links are likely to connect them. And if, in theory, uh, your method is right, A, you should find an association with the activity of these proteins, if you could measure it. And this we also show for some of these proteins there is phosphorylation data, and we could see that, in general, the activity of the nodes, which you estimate only from the expression, correlates well with the phosphorylation of the nodes. And when, once we did that, we decided to use this to uh, look at the drug response data, and this is a bit complex, let me try to walk you through. So as I said earlier, in this tool carnival, you take a sign-directed graph. From gene expression, you estimate transcription factors and uh, pathways. You generate uh, models, and in our case, we had around 1,000 cell lines, so we can do this 1,000 times. So we make one network model for each of the cell lines. And then we can then say, okay, if my method estimates that this node here is on, I would expect that there is an association with the drug efficacy of a drug that blocks this node, right? I would expect that if it's on, it's more likely to, that it's sensitive to the drug. And we have the cell line, the drug response for these cell lines, as I said before. And even, you could refine this a bit more, you could try to use the genomic data to, uh, kind of contextualize your starting network. Because these pathway resources, normally they don't give you cell type specific information, they are generic. So they tell you this protein activates this protein, but they don't tell you whether this is in a liver, in a brain, in the breast. Uh, but you can use 
genomic data to try to contextualize them before you run this causal inference. And in our case, we use mutational data that can tell us if a specific nodes are broken by a mutation, so therefore they don't work. So if this one is mutated, this edge here should not be functional. Or if you have RNA data, you should not use it kind of as a proxy of the protein level, as we said before, but if you have RNA-seq, where you count RNA and you have zero counts, it is very likely that there is no protein, so we decided to use that. Basically, if you have no counts, we remove some of the nodes in the network. So this meant that for each, net, for each cell line, we contextualize the starting network using the genomic and transcriptomic data. Then we use the pathway transcription factor activities to identify the paths that connect them. And then we try to see if this activity is related to the efficacy of the drug that hits on these proteins. Is that clear? Was a lot of things on one slide. If not, we can ask me later again. And again, this is a busy slide, but just to show that we, we found a lot of associations. So this is, each dot here is an association between the activity of a protein and the efficacy of a drug. And the ones in blue uh, are, so the ones in green are the ones that are uh, based on a genetic network. And the ones in blue, which are more, are when you further refine each network by using the genomic and transcriptomic data. So this suggests that you can, to some degree, contextualize a generic network using genomic data. So you will have a network specific for your cell line of interest, but the same is if you have a patient or any other type of sample. And then on this, you try to infer causal pathways. And then again, this is indirect uh, support that this is right, but if we find more meaningful things, biologically, we hope it's the case. Okay. And now something else. Uh, uh, we were talking before about multiomics, no? Uh, so, and what I just showed you in a way is a bit of a multiomic because I'm using genomic data, transcriptomic data, and the drug response data. But in another study, we tried to add more omics in this network context and try to combine transcriptomic, where we estimate kinase activities, phosphoproteomic, from which we can estimate kinase activities, and metabolomics, from which you can estimate metabolic uh, enzyme activities. This is not in this diagram, it's a different type of biology, but, and then we try to use this carnival to link them all together. And multiomics is a, a quite a exciting type of data. There is a lot of nice approaches, also based on the statistics, but we try to see if this kind of network and footprint approaches can be brought together in the context of analysis of multiomics data. And so what we had, and this was work done with Rafael Kamein, Achen, Christian Fretzer in Cambridge, and Jesper Olsen in Copenhagen. This is kidney cancer. When there is kidney cancer, sometimes the whole kidney is removed. And then you can have quite some material to do omics analysis. So we had 60 patients. And then we did mass spec and RNA-seq on the tumor and in the healthy. So we could have always a comparison, what is changing in the tumor versus the healthy ones. And then we did the things that I described before, the footprints, kinases from phosphocytes, uh, gene expression to estimate transcription factor activities, and from metabolic enzymes, from metabolomics you can estimate metabolic enzymes. And then using this carnival to try to connect them all together into a network. So what type of network we use? So we are used to Omnipath for use looking at signaling pathways, but now we need to add it metabolic networks. So we use Recon 3D, which is state-of-the-art metabolic network reconstruction. And we use Stitch, which is from Pea Bors Group, which gives you a lot of information on where that different um, metabolites bind. So kind of to close uh, uh, the loop of, of linking metabolites back to, to the proteins. So you have like a transomics network. So meaning connecting different omics, the different layers. And then once you have this network and you have the estimation of the different kinases and transcription factors, then you can run these causal inference methods. And uh, when you do this, you start with a huge hairball that is very common in bioinformatics, 70,000 interactions. But if you try to style the pathways that really connect 
the things that you see happening in your data, these kinases, transcription factor, and metabolic enzymes, you go down to 268 interactions, still a large network, but much more manageable. And it's all, um, you know, causal paths that to some degree are, are interpretable and, and that they are uh, um, quite connected to experiments. No? Like uh, you see that this blocks this, this activates this, and so forth. And, and again, it's combining metabolites, uh, phosphorylation data, and transcriptomic. And we don't have yet final validation, but they, this is ongoing at the moment. But the idea is that such network, because it's really, let's say, simple and interpretable, it's very amenable for, for even to do a validation in the lab where you say, OK, if I block this, what's going to happen down here, and so forth. Yes? Can you know when you have the results like that, if there is one omic layer that dominates the, the, the results of the signal, or if everything is participating at the same, uh, the same amount? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, the way we do it, that in a way we pre-compute features and then try to connect them. I mean, we haven't done this, no? But it's a good question. We could we should do it, and then I would think that what we simply think is that you know we are losing big chunks of the network because if you don't have metabolic data, the whole pathways towards the metabolomic you you don't know what happens, so they're gone. So it will be more like this. But you can do this in a more data-driven way. No? There are these uh, multifactorial statistical methods, which still really tell you yeah, how is the variability in each omics data in a pure data-driven way. So probably that would be, for the question of what dominates, I would probably go in a data-driven way. I mean, this complements it, but you are already kind of pre-filtering and um, yeah. uh, extracting kind of. Yeah, it might not be the good way to ask the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think they're complementary, of course. Yeah. Yes? How do you validate exponentially your network? And what is your process? So you would say, for example, uh, uh, and again, this is not the dynamic models where, where you kind of know more precisely to spec that you can simulate what if I knock down something. But here, you would hope or you would think that if there is a causal path, it is more likely that there is a mechanistic connection. But you don't know this. That's why you need to do these validations. But then you would say, OK, so um, my inferred diagram tells me that in the cancer samples, this is on, so this pathway is active and not in the controls. So if now I, I knock down this one here with a drag, I should see a change here in the cancer, but not in the control, which will not work all the time. This is an hypothesis generation, but if it happens, uh, significantly more than, than random, you, you, you can see that the method is, is giving mechanistic uh, interpretable hypothesis. Yeah? Yeah? If, if you're using recon R3, which is a metabolic model, you could, could you not simulate knockouts using flux balance analysis? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we didn't really use or went all the way with the metabolic network modeling, but in principle you could. So we focus just on kind of the immediate effect on the uh, from the metabolic enzymes to the direct uh, metabolites. But in principle, you could, yes, I think. Yeah, the back, and then. Really, uh, it's not easy, but it seems that there's quite a, there's not so much feedback in your yeah. in the image that you show. Is there something that? So feedbacks are really hard to learn if you don't have dynamics. So basically, and this is true. So if you don't have time series, it's hard to, to find out that there is a feedback. And in this case, these methods typically will not find them. Uh, but like with what I will talk about later, and, and when you will hear more dynamic models, you can really study the feedbacks. And, because it's really an effect of things compensating each other. Yeah. A couple of questions. Uh, the first, if you think that with the network, if you think a minimum network, would you finish with your set, with your small set of 200 something meters, but maybe less time? But maybe less? Maybe less time, because you say that it takes four hours, and maybe a lot of, maybe you have 67,000 yeah. nodes, maybe it's very hard. So maybe beginning with a more minimum network, Having all of your more important yeah. 
this indeed would work uh, or could work, but of course you need to know what's the important ones, which if you don't know, you risk to lose things. And this is always also a trade-off, right? So you, you can, uh, the more coverage, you will always have more false positives. And so our general approach is to indeed start small, and if it doesn't explain the data, the questions to keep adding. In this case, we, we went a bit more the other way around. Uh, but the, the computational time is not a big deal, right? Even if, it, because, you know, it's electricity, it's not, it doesn't cost much. Uh, once you have implemented the pipeline. Uh, yeah, but. Uh, and also for the most in cancer, you have also the alternative of cancer. Mm -hmm. So the data has a most question very changeable between the replicates. So how you deal with that? Do you, do you also include them in the analysis or you remove the ones that don't have kind of a three out of four uh, dimensionality in the sense of regulation that you find in the transcript collection? Let me see if, so I'm not sure I understood. So you say when there is a terrigent in the tumors, now you mean cell line to cell line or within a given cell line? Within a given cell line. Uh, so basically it's when you also are working in animals and you have the, the biological replicate value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like you have five different measurements for the same gene and they are really going changing in two directions, like three out of two. So it's a good question, uh, and mouse, of course, will be more variable. I mean, the cell lines are less variable, but you have some. And uh, I mean, you could wait. The, um, so at the end, you, your input will be, let's say, a, a fold change with an associated p-value, mm -hmm. and in, you can handle this in your statistics, like weight it differently, or you can put a minimum threshold and say, okay, if if the signal is very noisy, I simply don't take it into account. Yeah, I think it will depend a bit on the specific case. But yeah, this is very important also. Okay, I'll continue. So it was good discussion, and now I wanted to, um, yeah, to, so to, to show you something a bit different, but just to summarize what I said, uh, so, Using these mechanistic signatures and the examples I saw you, I think it has added value. It helps, but there is still a lot of room for improvement. So there is really not a, a solved problem. And you know, everything I saw you on this large collection of cell lines is the work of our group with our collaborators. But of course, there is a lot of smart people out there that could maybe also help us to solve this problem. So given that you know we couldn't do it. Uh, to, to the point that we're satisfied, we also thought, okay, why don't we let anyone in, in the world to try to help us solve this problem? So then what we did is to, to use a kind of framework of crowdsourcing. Anyone is familiar with this? No one else? That's good. Uh, so the idea of crowdsourcing is that uh, in it, instead of solving a problem, you let the community to solve it. And if you have, in our case, uh, the question of prediction of drug response, so you make public some trained data so people can build their models, whatever they want, and whoever wants to do it. You would hold some data, a test data, that then is what you use to, to assess how well the methods do. So the, the, any people take this data, they build the models, you ask them to predict this, test data, kind of in a classic machine learning context, and then you score that. And the idea is that it's unbiased because if I score the method but I don't build the method, I will, I'm not biased to, to, because I don't know the results. You always ask for the code and explanation of the method, so you have reproducibility. It can be applied to many type of different questions. I will show you the one drug response, but has been applied to disease modules or predict drug single combinations and so forth. And, and you can also run it uh, if you have data that you cannot share. For example, from patients, you can use a virtualization environment so you can ask people to submit the algorithms in a container, like a Docker, so, so that you can also use clinical data. And something very nice that you win something called the wisdom of the crowds. Do you know what that is? Okay, I think not. not. But maybe, uh, even if you know, I don't know if you know how old this idea is of the wisdom of the crowds, so this goes all the way back to Galton, who, 
over a century ago, it was very, so Carlton is one of the fathers of statistics, uh, among other things, uh, but he was interested in this question of, is it worth, or what, what is the value and the strengths of asking people of, of their opinion and, and to bring their results. And so what he went is, it needs to go to a, a market in the south of England, in Plymouth, where the farmers had like their own game, they will have an ox, and they will try to guess the weight. And, and so every, every, every farmer or will, will say a different number, and, and the one who is the closest will get the ox. And so he asked them, uh, over 800 farmers, and then he computed the median of what all, all of them were saying, which was 1,197 pounds, and it was almost exactly the right weight. Even though no single uh, participant got that close, by averaging them, he got a super good result. And, uh, and, and this idea is what is also behind a lot of approaches in bioinformatics or machine learning, ensemble of models. And you can leverage it in the context of this crowdsourcing. So in our case, it's called the dream challenge, how we do this. Because you bring a lot of methods from a lot of people, and by building like a meta algorithm from what everybody else proposed, you typically do better than any single method. So, but anyway, back to the question of drug prediction. So we apply this idea to predict drug response. So you have data on some cell lines, you withhold from some other cell lines. And then, uh, to cut a long story short, uh, here you have how well the people did. These are all the 44 different teams. This is a, a parameter which should go all the way up to one here, and this is like random prediction. And as you can see, all but one did better than random, so they were able to get something out of the data, but nobody did really well. So what I'm trying to say with this is that I showed you before our efforts to predict drug response, they were not fully satisfactory, but it was not just us, if you let other people try, they don't do much better. Then we did another challenge on a similar question, which is prediction of toxicology, and we have very similar results. So it is just very hard to predict drug response, and uh, there must be something else. So anyone has any idea why is it so hard? What is missing? Yeah? Sometimes it strikes me that biology is chaotic. Biology is chaotic. <laughs> Reproducibility, yeah. Okay, it's true. Something else? So there are different reasons, and probably uh, more than what I, I could tell you. So there's certainly the problem of noise reproducibility is important. Maybe you will need more samples. Maybe you will need to add more omics. But uh, a very important aspect is that in these cases, you are trying to predict drug response from basal data. So you profile your cell lines at basal status, and then you try to predict whether a drug uh, works or not. And, and, and this is hard, right? Because the effect of the drug is a dynamic process that you're trying to predict from a basal characterization. And so somebody put this in, the, in very, I think, uh, uh, eloquent manner. So it's Tony Latai from Boston. And he say, so consider trying to predict what happens if you poke a dog with a stick so an analogy to, to what uh, we've been doing now, right, is to kill the dog, make all sorts of omics, and then use that huge data set to, to predict what happens when you hit the dog with the stick. But the functional approach is hit the dog with the stick and see what happens. And this is the same. So it's very hard to predict the effect of the drug simply from basal. Maybe we should see how drugs cell responds to drugs. Because whether a drug works or doesn't work is a dynamic process, so you may have a hyperactive pathway, hit it with a drug, and hope to, in this case, to stop the growth of the cancer cell. But there are feedbacks that we discussed earlier. There are other compensatory pathways, and these are intrinsic dynamic processes that are very hard to see unless you have dynamic data, time series response data. So then, to complement this more high-scale basal profiling, what we also try to do is to stimulate cells with uh, with ligands or with drugs, and to look at changes downstream, gene expression, or ideally directly in the activity of proteins, which is phosphorylation. 
And uh, in particular, the phosphorylation data after perturbations is where we use the dynamic modeling that I introduced in the first part of the talk. Uh, and one point that I think is, is quite important is also, oh, why do you try to learn your dynamic network uh, using biological knowledge? Why don't you just use the data? Right, the data is pure and let the data speak, it will give you the best model. But on the other hand, certainly biological knowledge, all these pathway databases have a lot of information. So then we also use this dream, this crowdsourcing framework to ask the question of what's the best way to learn dynamic uh, models from signaling networks. And uh, what is st sticked out from that analysis is that using biological knowledge, using networks helps. So here you see the performance, the rock of the teams that use biological knowledge and those that did not use biological knowledge and those that use it did better and those that did the best, the best teams, they all use biological knowledge. Okay, so it does help to use biological knowledge to build dynamic models. And uh, using this idea is, uh, in our case, this logic model that I introduced before in the first part. So we take a generic network, we take perturbation experiments, and basically, it's a process of training the biological network to the data to build a logic model. And in terms of applications, so if it's, is it true that looking at the dynamics and looking at these uh, processes that are dynamic and that are a response to perturbations help us to understand better drug response? So what we did is to go back to the large screening where we had thousands of lines and 400 drugs, but only basal data. And we sub-selected some cell lines of drugs where the performance was very poor. And then we tried to generate these more rich and dynamic experiments, so like a deep dive. So you take those cell lines and you try to measure phosphorylation of key proteins with the stimulation of ligands and drugs. And then to try to take that data and biological knowledge to build uh, logic uh, models. And this was work we did with uh, Niels Blutgen in Berlin and Matthew Garner at Sanger. We look at colon cancer cell lines, which was a tissue where we were really bad in predicting only from basal data. We took 14 cell lines. We generated this phosphorylation data after perturbation. And we took a generic network. We trained it separately for each cell line. So at the end of the day, uh, you get one model for each uh, cell line. And then we try to see if there is an association between the changes in the models across the cell lines and the efficacy of the drugs, right? So, and the idea is that if something is highly correlated with the efficacy of a drug, it is likely to be connected mechanistically. So these are the models. The details don't matter, but just to show that there is different wiring. And if you could see in detail, you would see that some of the edges are always active in all of the cell lines. Some are in none, and some are in some yes, and in some not. And these are all colon cancer cell lines, right? So even though they're all the same tumor type, they can have different pathways, the same way that different actual patients with colon cancer will be different the tumors. So you see this also in the cell lines as well. And then uh, we were able to learn a number of things, but to the question if can we find a new explanation of why a drug works or doesn't work, I will show you just one example. So we found a strong association between the activity of GSK3 in the dynamic model. So tau is a parameter that tells us how fast this kinase responds to stimulation in the model, and the efficacy of an inhibitor that blocks another kinase called MEK in a different pathway. So these are the 14 cell lines, and simply what you see, there is a correlation. The more active GSK3, the higher the IC50, that means less effective is the drug. So the reason, if this is not just a, a correlation, but there is really a mechanistic connection, we should be able to take the cell lines here, and by blocking GSK3, by making this parameter going towards zero, they should become sensitive to MEK. The IC50 should be lower. And we did this for the 14 cell lines. I'll only show you the, the extremes. This is just a control. The cell lines here, you see no effect of the GSK3 inhibitor, and they went up here using two different GSK3 inhibitors, which is the red and the blue curves, you see an increase in the sensitivity. And this is just an example of how these dynamic models will find things that you will not see looking at the basal data. Because for all these cell lines, 
when we look at the genomic and transcriptomic, we could see no biomarker of drug efficacy, let alone an explanation of how to overcome the resistance with a second drug. Okay. So I'm coming to an end. I will just very briefly, in a few minutes, uh, go through the other things. But uh, I think uh, uh, I show the most important things. So one thing that is very exciting uh, for us is how to do this with single cells. So what I saw until now is looking in bulk. So you take a cell line and it comes back to the question of heterogeneity in a way. And you have like an average measurement for your cell lines. But now there are ways to not to look at the average of the cells, but to get the phosphorylation of individual cells in an experiment. So very recently we have used this type of data with a group of Bernbaud and Miller in Zurich to do more or less the same. I will just not uh, get into the details, but just to say that you can do this also now, but really look at it into the single cell level. And I will just try to wrap up now. So I talk about these pharmacogenomic screenings that we are really useful resources to try to understand drug efficacy and to relate this to molecular features. But also how pure machine learning, just throwing the data into your algorithm, is very limited. So it will not really <coughs> uh, get you very far. But with examples I saw you and other groups uh, as well, uh, I think it's clear that using biological knowledge can help in this problem and that combining this basal characterization with more dynamic perturbation-based type of experiments can help a lot. But the last thing I want to talk about, uh, which I think actually is the most important one in this context, is how can we then take this actually to the clinic? Because all the things I saw you in this talk is based on the cell lines. And the cell lines are very different from the patient, right? Uh, so that you're able to stop the growth of a cell in the dish doesn't mean that it will work in the patient. And the, the challenge is, is that it's much more difficult, obviously, to collect and to perform experiments directly from, from patients and how we can really use the data that we get in the lab for that question. And so one thing that uh, you can try to do to try to go from this in vitro to this in vivo setting is to use intermediate systems like mouse models, organoids, and so forth, or trying to generate data directly from um, uh, material from patients, from tissues. And now I'm talking about perturbation data, right? So it is possible from patients to do the basic omics, like genomic transcriptomic, but it's really not feasible to do all these drug perturbations because you will need a lot of material. So what we did is to work with uh, Christoph Merten at EMBL and the clinics in, in Aachen to use microfluidics. And the idea is that you do a mini perturbation experiment in each uh, droplet. So in a very tiny uh, uh, drop of, of oil, you encapsulate a few cells with some drugs. And, and so because you do this with a very small number of cells, you can do this a large experiment with directly from a patient biopsy, and it's all automatic, so it's very fast. And we could use this data to do the same thing, so to take a prior knowledge, the drug perturbation data from the patients, uh, build for each patient a dynamic logic model, and then uh, validate some of the predictions in the cell lines. Because again, so the value of these dynamic models is that you can ask them questions such as, okay, what happens if now I block something here and I stimulate here, what will happen with my readout of interest? So you can do this on the model and then validate this. And of course, you cannot validate directly on the patients because you're not allowed to try on patient, at least uh, in general, new drugs, but we could use the cell line to validate the capacity of the models to predict the effect of drugs, but we also shown that we can build such models directly from patients. And I think this is really important if modeling is supposed to help really towards more clinical applications. And the next thing for us that what we are starting to work on now is how we can move directly to look at the tissues and by tissues also taking into account the special context. So what I saw you now with these droplets we can look at actual cells from patients, but these are dissociated, so they are not together with the other cells that they were before. But that's, again, that's also very important when you want to look at uh, all of these questions because the tissue is, is a community of cells. So on one hand, we are using single cell RNA technology 
to estimate activities of pathways and transcription factors in individual cells that you can extract from different tissues. We're trying to find ways to understand their cell-cell interactions using the tools that uh, we discussed for transcription factor and pathways, but also other tools to look at ligand receptor interactions. And, and our long-term aim is to use this to build really dynamic models that we can then use to simulate over, over time, but also over space, different cells, how they interact, and how drugs affect them. But that's uh, still early days, so uh, I'll finish here. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the people in the lab. Uh, so what I saw you today is mostly, so the pathway method was done by Michael Schubert, the transcription factor by Luz Garfiel, and so uh, Francesco and Michael Mendel did a lot of the drug prediction work. The logic modeling uh, is uh, uh, different people, like in particular Ennio, Attila, and, and before also Federica. And uh, we, yeah, we collaborate with a large number of experimental and, and computational groups uh, in, in different places. So I saw you the microfluidics work with Christoph, the mass cytometry with Bern, and uh, also yeah, with other, other groups. Uh, and I'll just finish with this uh, summary slide of uh, on the left what uh, I tried to show you today and, and this figure that I think try to summarize all these approaches to build network-based models, in our case directly from patients. So we use knowledge to generate a generic network. We train the generic network to data. This data sometimes is static, but ideally is dynamic after perturbation, and sometimes it's direct, the phosphorylation of the proteins sometimes is more indirect, like the change in the transcriptome. But we use different algorithms to use that data to generate models for each patient that we use to gain mechanistic insight and to predict uh, therapies. And yeah, uh, this is what I, I said also before, the importance of look at benchmarks, the importance to consider footprints of processes, and uh, yeah, that's it. Also, if any one of you in the future wants to do some of this, we will be looking for students and postdocs. And yeah, with that, I'd like to finish. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.